How to Recover from Too Much Omega-3. This is the answer to Iris from Denmark, who has generously donated one hour of her consultation with me to you, the community, to share these issues with a greater number of people whom they might help. Iris has a series of questions that are based on how she is trying to solve health problems that seem to have begun as a result of a long time eating way too much omega-3s on the belief that more is better. So her story is that she's been taking omega-3 supplements for years She's taken about two to four grams of omega-3 supplements per day for over a decade and eaten fish two to five days a week and had been on a low-fat diet at the same time and for the last about five years had little to no eggs, no liver because of food intolerances. And now recently she has, for a little over two months, been taking 0.8 0.8 grams of arachidonic acid a day, 2 grams of oil containing 40% of arachidonic acid, so 0.8 grams of pure arachidonic acid a day. In the last couple of weeks, she's been taking 4 to 5 times the 0.8 grams pure arachidonic acid per day. No fish, no omega-3 for about 5 to 6 months. A lot of her symptoms have gotten better in this period and no symptoms have, as far as she has been able to gather, gotten any worse. Iris's symptoms included a multitude of food intolerances, including histamine, lectins, and salicylates, carbohydrates, and calcium citrate supplements, which were giving her symptoms such as diarrhea, nerve pains, brain fog, rashes, and depression. While these intolerances are not completely gone, her ability to tolerate these foods and supplements without any symptoms has strongly increased, and what she tolerates has broadened. Her rock-bottom libido has begun to improve, brain fog has reduced, and many things are completely better. The rashes that she had on her face and neck have disappeared. The dandruff she had have disappeared. The yeast infections, gone. Post-exercise foot pain, gone. Improved exercise tolerance, she can do a lot more without getting as out of breath as she used to. PMS, gone. Our hypothesis is that many of these things are classical symptoms of essential fatty acid deficiency driven by deficient arachidonic acid, as well as excess EPA from fish and fish oil, which impairs arachidonic acid metabolism, especially the conversion of arachidonic acid to, acid to prostaglandin E2. In the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, loss of prostaglandin E2 will lead to widespread food intolerances and Throughout the body, deficient prostaglandin E2 will drive deficient cell-to-cell junction proteins, which will lead to the dysregulation of calcium distribution, leading to many neurological problems, including nerve pain. It's possible that some of the improvement in Iris' symptoms have been driven by strategies that she has used alongside the change in fatty acid composition in her diet, which include calcium as she's been able to increase her toleration of it and vitamin K2 to assist in proper calcium distribution. But these are all in line with the general hypothesis. And Iris's belief and my belief is that the critical driving factor in symptomatic improvement in the bulk of these symptoms is improved arachidonic acid intake as well as cutting out the excess of EPA from fish oil. And she has a series of questions about how to manage this, which all focus on several things, whether she should be primarily thinking about trying to protect against the total PUFA burden versus trying to protect against distortions in the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, especially in the relationship between DHA and arachidonic acid and the relationship between EPA and arachidonic acid. So here are her questions. Question number one, 
Is it correct that the body needs enough of both omega-3 and omega-6 to deal with inflammation? Yes, this is exactly correct. So what happens in the inflammatory process is that in the initiation phase, you have centrally, you mediate the process with prostaglandin E2, which is derived from the omega-6 fatty acid or arachidonic acid. And prostaglandin E2 remains a central governor of the inflammatory process throughout its entire resolution. But in the resolution phase, prostaglandin E2 recruits the use of DHA or docosahexaenoic acid, which is an omega-3 fatty acid, in order to aid in the inflama- in the resolution process. Now, the role of EPA is controversial. There is no ability of EPA to participate in the resolution process on its own in the absence of certain modifying factors. The main one is aspirin. There is some evidence that bacteria can modify the EPA in a similar way as aspirin, allowing it to participate in the resolution process. And you could hypothesize from that that perhaps depending on the microbiome, perhaps in combinations with certain probiotics, you can allow EPA to act as a pro-resolving chemical in the absence of aspirin. But I think it's it's pretty clear to me that the default position is that normal physiology uses arachidonic acid to initiate inflammation and uses both arachidonic acid, and DHA together to resolve inflammation, and that EPA really belongs with pharmacology. You can use a drug-like approach to use a combination of EPA and aspirin, or perhaps a combination of EPA and probiotics or whatever, to biohack that system. But the normal process is that when inflammation is supposed to resolve the body will call on both arachidonic acid and DHA to make that happen. So, yeah, the answer to that question is, yes, it's correct that the body needs enough of both omega-3 and omega-6 to deal with inflammation. She follows that up and says, so too little of either arachidonic acid or DHA or too little of both would then lead to constant chronic low-grade inflammation. That's exactly right. So, if you if you lack enough arachidonic acid, that may compromise your ability to reach a high peak inflammation, much in the way that you can use an NSAID, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, to block the metabolism of arachidonic acid and prevent you from reaching a high rate of peak inflammation. However, because arachidonic acid is used through its metabolism to prostaglandin E2, Arachidonic acid deficiency and blocking arachidonic acid metabolism with an NSAID or with the omega-3 fatty acid EPA, which acts as an NSAID, will create chronic low-grade inflammation. It doesn't do you much good to avoid reaching a high peak if you never resolve the low-grade inflammation that you have. Now, for DHA, if... Prostaglandin E2 from arachidonic acid in the resolution phase is going to call on DHA to help it resolve inflammation, then if you don't have the DHA, you have the same problem. Regardless of whatever peak you reached, you can't fully resolve inflammation without both arachidonic acid and DHA, so therefore you wind up with chronic low-grade inflammation. Iris' second question is, I'm hoping to be pregnant soon, so I really worry that high doses of arachidonic acid and no DHA is harmful for the baby and the mother during a pregnancy. She says, I know that a baby needs DHA for its brain's development. I'm trying to find a supplement that just contains DHA and no EPA, where I'm not allergic to some of the ingredients in the supplement. So far, I've had no success in this, so I have three options. For what to do during a pregnancy. And I want to hear your opinion on what you think would be best. Option number one, search and try to find a DHA supplement. Option number two, eat no fish and no DHA supplement during pregnancy. In parentheses, she puts, this is not something I myself think is wise. 
it alarms me since the baby does need DHA, for example, its brain's development. But maybe I have so much in storage in my body that this is okay. And then option number three is eat some fish every week. The bad side effect of eating some fish every week is that I will get some EPA through the fish that will, to some degree, block the arachidonic acid, but I don't know how important in the treatment is to completely avoid EPA. But on the plus side, I will also get a broader diet with sources of DHA and different micronutrients. I'm hyperallergic to lectins, histamines, and salicylates, so I already have a limited diet. So I would say option two, which is eat no fish and no DHA supplement during pregnancy is the worst option. And this is primarily because even though you undoubtedly have a store of DHA, it's not very clear how much will be mobilized because there's a lot of things that can affect the mobilization of the DHA, especially if it's an adipose tissue. So, you know, for example, and I'll, I'll go back to an old animal study that I read when I did my deepest dives into this topic that showed that you could develop essential fatty acid deficiency if you're on an IV drip because if you don't have any essential fatty acids in the diet, the constant drip of glucose solution prevents the mobilization of fats from adipose tissue and the release of linoleic acid that could then be moved to the liver and be converted to arachidonic acid for use in the prevention of essential fatty acid deficiency. Now, you know, you're not going to be on an IV glucose drip when you're pregnant, but that but the point is there are many factors in your diet and lifestyle that could give you a higher or a lower rate of lipo of adipose tissue lipolysis. And so, and especially with no measurements of one of one of the problems is that there's a lot of lab data that I would like to see that Iris doesn't have access to because she lives in Denmark and doesn't have access to some of the labs that we have in the United States. And so in the absence of knowing the tissue concentrations of any of these things, and in the absence of knowing whether you're going to have a higher or lower rate of adipose tissue lipolysis of this presumed store of DHA, I think it's too much of a risk to try to eat zero DHA during a pregnancy when we know it's so critical for brain development. So I think option number two is the worst option. And I would say option number one is the best option in this situation because it avoids the symptoms that, you know, we don't have uh, objective data demonstrating this, but based on what Iris has tried, it seems like the low omega-3 supplement arachidonic acid regime has been working for the past five or six months. And so option number one, if the symptoms are driven by too much EPA, not enough arachidonic acid, option number one helps get around putting EPA back into the system and possibly aggravating some of those, those symptoms. And option three, I think, avoids the greater risk of not getting enough DHA for the baby. So in my view, I would say keep looking for a DHA supplement that you tolerate or option one is the ideal. And then plan B is if that fails, eat some fish every week as the next best thing out of those three options. Iris's third question is, regarding omega-3, does the body have a storage of omega-3 from all my years of getting too much so that I should leave out fish and her supplements for a period. This kind of gets to what I was just talking about. You have this, you certainly have a store. The question is, to what degree are you accessing it at any, at any given time? And the data that I've seen are from animal studies and very limited human data, but they suggest that a human would probably take about four years 
to maximize their tissue concentrations of any given fatty acid. And it would take about four years of eating differently to equilibrate to a new fatty acid composition. So if you go from a, and I'm generalizing from data that was looking mainly at linoleic acid, but there just, there is no corresponding very long-term data for EPA. So I'm just lim working with a very limited data set. I would say that if you spent four or more years eating a very high EPA diet and supplement regime, it's probably going to take four years of the regime that you've been doing over the last five or six months to get back to where you were originally. Now, that's not to say that you have to wait four to five years to see substantial benefit. Probably most of the benefit comes earlier, right? Because if it took you four or five years to realize that you were doing something wrong in reverse course, then it's probably the worst case scenario at the end of those four or five years that is causing you the most problems and you can get rid of that worst case scenario within within the first year or so um, of a of a five year normalization scheme. So it might be something like uh, maybe 30% of the benefit is gotten in the, I'm just making these numbers up what seems reasonable to me, but it might be something like 30 to 40% of the benefit is gotten after a year of changing the diet. And then that drops down to 10 or 15% in the next year. And then that drops down, you know, a little bit further and further such that you reach a hundred percent after five years. Uh, but a, a lot of that benefit is front loaded to the earlier part of that normalization schedule. That's what, that's how I would guess it would go. And I think that Iris's experience supports that because she says she's feeling a lot better over the first, uh, over the first five to six months of this. Her next question is whether to focus on too much PUFA, polyunsaturated fatty acids, versus the omega-6 to omega-3 balance, which has practical implications for whether she should be trying to boost up arachidonic acid if it's an omega-3-6 thing versus trying to boost up vitamin E if it's a total PUFA thing. I'm going to read her full question, but I'm going to say that it's probably a little bit of both. And there's no, you know, without without measuring anything, there's no way to distinguish between the two. So it probably makes sense to cover both bases to some degree. All right. So Ira says, I see two ways with high doses of omega-3 being harmful. The first one is that high doses of polyunsaturated fatty acids lead to a lack of vitamin E, and the other one being that EPA blocks the absorption of arachidonic acid. So I would step in here and say, EPA is not blocking the absorption of arachidonic acid. It's not preventing you from getting it from the intestines into your tissues. It's blocking the utilization of arachidonic acid in the tissues. So it, it blocks, to some degree, its incorporation to, into the cell membrane because they're both 20 carbon fatty acids and so they occupy the same sites within the membrane and on top of that it blocks its metabolism by the cyclooxygenase or cox enzymes which are the targets of NSAID drugs and that's again because they're similar carbon length and they're both highly unsaturated and so they look very they behave look and behave very similarly and what EPA is really doing is it's just being metabolized as an alternative substrate by the enzyme to produce compounds that don't have the same efficacy as those produced by the arachidonic acid. So let's take out the word absorption and, and put in its place utilization. Iris continues, do you see more ways than these two in with high doses of PUFA or omega-3 can be harmful? Example, high doses of any PUFA leading to more permeable or weak cell membranes. Um, 
having too many PUFAs in your cell membranes will make the cell membranes more fluid. And that's conceivable as a potential harm, but it's it's not that likely to happen compared to other risks, such as the propensity to have oxidative damage in the cell membranes and the interference with arachidonic acid. And the main reason is that the cell has multiple ways of controlling the fluidity of its membranes, and it isn't really at the mercy of any given one fatty acid. So one of the things that it can do is it can just store PUFAs in adipose tissue. And that's one of the reasons why PUFAs wind up getting... Well, it can also just burn them for energy, right? And so the fact that PUFAs are more rapidly burned for energy is why you can do a two-week study. And this has been done at least twice. You do a two-week study and show with really high-tech imaging, you know, fancy, stupid study because it's two weeks long, but fancy study because it's got magnetic resonance spectroscopy and all this, you know, fancy ways of measuring liver fat. And you can show that in two weeks, PUFAs will lower liver fat, uh, you know, and come to some ridiculous conclusions like, I don't know, drink beer and eat seed oils. <laughs> and, you know, uh, anyway, which, you know, which is terrible for your liver if you look at longer term animal studies. Um, and actually, if you look at animals, they they have many ways of getting rid, rid of PUFAs. And so uh, in animal studies, not only do they burn them at a higher rate and put them in their adipose tissues at a higher rate, but they will also exude them into the fur and they will turn them into saturated fatty acids by just breaking them all the way down into acetyl-CoA and building them all the way back up into a new a new saturated fatty acid. Humans don't have fur, but I, I'm not sure if we do this in the hair. Um, I mean, definitely a lot of, of PUFA goes into the skin, but the point is there are many, there are many routes to just avoid putting too much PUFA in the cell membrane in the first place. So it's, it's probably, I guess, now that I think about it, it's probably the case that the vulnerability to having too much EPA versus arachidonic acid in the cell membrane is greater than the vulnerability to having too many PUFAs in the cell membrane. Because the reason that you can wind up with that ratio twisted is because the enzymes that incorporate arachidonic acid into the cell membrane basically see EPA as the equivalent of arachidonic acid, the same way the Cox enzymes do. So EPA is really an imposter of arachidonic acid in the cell membrane, and it gets around the regulation. And one of the things that influenced my view on this is that I was reading a study that Ralph Holman had published. Ralph Holman was the... Um, he was originally a grad student of George Burr, who, with his wife Mildred, had discovered the essential fatty acids. One of Holman's big claim to fame claims to fame was that he got the U.S. military to start feeding spam to its soldiers. Uh, but he also published an enormous amount of essential fatty acid research. Uh, he he also, I think, w should take credit for getting the. Uh, total parenteral nutrition, which is intravenous nutrition in people who can't eat food in the hospital to include essential fatty acids on the basis that they were getting eczema. Although when they started doing that, one of the oils that they used was really high in, in omega-6 linoleic acid, very low in omega-3 alpha linoleic acid, and it caused all kinds of neurological problems in a girl with an abdominal gunshot wound who was on it for six months. Double vision, blurry vision, and so on. Uh, 
So I, I don't know, putting the, putting the oils in the TPN, I don't know if it worked out that well. But Pullman also was able to solve that puzzle and, uh, and get an omega-3, omega-6 balance in the oils that were added to TPN. Anyway, so Ralph Pullman's group did this study many, many, like well over 50 years ago. And it showed that in rats, the EPA concentration of their tissues was zero un unless they were given kidney damage. And then it went up. And I, I kind of looked at that and I was like, you know, these healthy animals, as long as they're not eating fish, they don't have any, they have a highly regulated amount of DHA in their tissues, but they have no EPA. It's kind of hard to see how EPA is an essential fatty acid in mammals if these very representative man mammals just have no EPA. And so it's not, you know, if you eat fish, which I think everyone should eat some fish, you'll have EPA in your tissues. So I'm not arguing that you want zero EPA in your tissues. I'm just saying if rats get by fine with zero EPA in their tissues and they convert all the omega-3 and the plant oils they're given into DHA, I don't really see why humans need to have EPA in their system. So I, that has really shaped that's one study has very much shaped my interpretation of all the other data and i'm not saying anyone should hang their hat on one old study it's just that there is no data clearly showing any any uh essential physiological role for epa whatsoever you know there's data on pharmacological benefits of high dose epa for elevated blood triglycerides and for certain psychiatric conditions but that's a drug, in my view. So anyway, I th I think because EPA is an imposter of arachidonic acid, there's not a very good way to keep it out of the cell membrane in relation to arachidonic acid. In other words, the cell will regulate its own, the fluidity of its membranes. But it's not going to regulate the balance between EPA and arachidonic acid because the balance is probably an infinite ratio. The ideal balance is probably to have only arachidonic acid and not EPA in the cell membrane. But EPA gets in there in the first place because it just totally work, gets around the cell's regulation because it is an imposter of arachidonic acid. So that probably is the top number one problem. The number two problem is that Total PUFA burden is an oxidative liability. So you can have, in the presence of oxidative stress, you'll get more oxidative damage with those PUFAs. Now, it's, I think it's clear that they don't automatically cause oxidative stress. Otherwise, the research on human PUFA substitution trials would be much more clearly, unanimously, straightforwardly making, look, making vegetable oils look very bad. It doesn't. The data is a mess. And I think part of the reason the data is a mess is that the oxidative damage is not automatic, right? You, you saturate your tissues in PUFA and then you got to wait for, it's like building the fire with a lot of kindling wood. You still got to light a match to make that thing burn down. So I think that that's kind of the number two issue. And it, to some degree, it is restricted by the fact that the cell is regulating its membrane fluidity. Now, the thing is, membrane fluidity is not just a function of PUFA. It's also a function of monounsaturated and saturated fats. And it's also a function of cholesterol content. And it's also a function of other things that are in the membrane. But if we just focus on the lipids, you know, just with the fatty acids, the cell can say, all right, more PUFA, I'm going to lower MUFA, and I'm going to increase saturated fats because there are multiple cats you can skin to get to a certain amount of membrane fluidity. It's, it's really sort of like, to, to oversimplify a little bit, it's basically you're just trying to modify the double bond content of 
the cell membrane. And so you've got mono, you got saturated fats with no double bonds. You've got monounsaturated fats with one double bond. You've got polyunsaturated fats with two double bonds, three double bonds, four double bonds, five double bonds, six double bonds. And so you get more, um, you get more arachidonic acid. You got four double bonds. You get more EPA. You got five double bonds. You can just cut down on some of the things that are two double bonds, one double bond. Increase the saturated fatty acid. You get the same membrane fluidity. Now the problem is, you get an elevated level of oxidative damage. But to some degree, you've also helped regulate the membrane fluidity and the oxidative damage risk by putting the PUFAs in adipose tissue, by burning them for energy at a higher rate, you know, by, maybe by exuding them in your fur or whatever. Um, and then, you know, actually having dysfunctional membrane fluidity, I think, is bottom of the barrel in terms of risk because there are so many compensatory mechanisms that the cell can have to maintain the degree of fluidity that it wants. So Iris says it's it's important to work out whether we want to be more concerned about the arachidonic acid balance versus the total PUFA content because if she's being harmed by the EPA specifically interfering with arachidonic acid metabolism, then the treatment would be to take relatively high doses of arachidonic acid. But if the high dose omega-3 is harmful because High doses of, of omega-3 mean that there's a high dose of PUFAs, and I therefore need extra vitamin E, then the treatment would be to make sure to get enough vitamin E and to take low doses of arachidonic acid or maybe no arachidonic acid at all, and of course, no omega-3. All right. So look, there. the ideal way to do this would be to measure your red blood cell phospholipid arachidonic acid EPA and DHA content. But one of Iris's concerns is not having access to adequate testing. And so I think the second best way to test is through self-experimentation. And so what you really want to do is try the low PUFA diet with and without the arachidonic acid, give it enough time to do something and see what's helping you more. But if I had to pick a hypothesis to favor, it would be that you want to focus on increasing the arachidonic acid, both because when you're preparing for pregnancy, I think it's very important to have adequate arachidonic acid tissue status. If I were to form a hypothesis I that to favor, I would consider the arachidonic acid EPA balance to be the top priority. And that's because of what I said earlier, the ability of the cell to compensate for the arachidonic acid EPA balance is lowest, making it the top priority. The ability of the cell to compensate for the liability to oxidative damage is intermediate. So it's the secondary problem. And the ability of the cell to compensate for membrane fluidity is very high, making it the least, uh, the least concern out of the three. Ira says, I am also thinking that maybe I have both problems at once, and therefore if I take high doses of arachidonic acid, that will help with one aspect of the problem described in A, but have just the opposite effect in the other aspect of having PUFA, high PUFA described in B. And then she asks, in thinking along these lines, should she be thinking of high doses of PUFA in to as a total, or is it in a ratio to saturated fat in other words, is the harm too much PUFA or, or is it only the ratio of saturated fat, uh, of PUFA to saturated fat? And does eating more fat in general, both eating more PUFA and eating more saturated fat, just mean that you then take up less PUFA if the body uses the same channels for taking up fat? First of all, you're going to absorb most of your fat. And if you if you don't, you're going to have greasy stools. So I think you want... you. For all practical purposes, you just assume all the fat that you eat is absorbed, barring actual symptoms of fat malabsorption like floating greasy stools. So I think that the your intake of 
saturated fat is kind of irrelevant. You are able to make saturated fat from carbohydrate. Um, I guess I shouldn't say it's irrelevant. You know, the rate at which you do that is fairly low, but it's sufficient to match the structural requirements for saturated fats. And it's saturated fats and monounsaturated fats are equally uh equally invulnerable to peroxidation so it's i think it's really just about total total PUFA rather than the ratio to anything else when you're thinking of oxidative damage risk because it's PUFA in relation to all these other things that don't peroxidize such as saturated fats monounsaturated fats carbohydrates and protein or the saturated fats and monounsaturated fats that you make from the carbohydrates when you need to um so I yeah I would I would ignore the saturated fat content entirely. Now one of the issues with vitamin E is that vitamin E is called a chain breaking antioxidant because it's capable of breaking lipid peroxidation chain reactions. You may have heard you can never break the chain. You can break the chain with vitamin E, but what you can't do with vitamin E is prevent an a uh, PUFA from oxidizing in the first place. So think of it as um, a domino reaction in the cell membrane. With no vitamin E, you knock down one domino and the rest of the dominoes knock down. With vitamin E, you knock down one domino and you stop there. Someone has to come over and individually knock down the second domino and vitamin E will stop it there. But you can never stop an oxidant that reaches the cell membrane from oxidizing the first PUFA with vitamin E, you can only stop a chain reaction. So therefore, more PUFA all, and, or more oxidants always means more lipid peroxidation. It's just that vitamin E is there for damage control and prevents it from getting out of hand. Now, that said, the evidence suggests that you want 0 0.6 milligrams of alpha tocopherol for every gram of PUFA in the diet. And so you can calculate that out. You may well be getting that. Um, now with that said, that's if you start with vitamin E. So I, one of the issues is that when your PUFA accumulate in your adipose tissue, all your vitamin E moves into the adipose tissue to protect it. And the turnover of the vitamin E is much higher than the turnover of the PUFA. So you basically have an elevated vitamin E requirement during the period, during that four to five period your period where you are adjusting your diet. So what I would go do is go back to the diet that you believed was causing the harm years ago, calculate 0 0.6 milligrams of alpha tocopherol per gram of PUFA in that diet, and then get a supplement of vitamin E that has a mixed tocopherol and tocotrienol background so all eight forms of vitamin E, but lists the exact amount of alpha tocopherol and take that supplement to match not the total vitamin E, but the alpha tocopherol listed on that supplement to the 0 0.6 milligram per gram UFA ratio of the old diet. I think that's a good way to quantitate how much vitamin E you probably currently need as a result of that. And then I would not worry about the arachidonic acid adding to the total PUFA because that's the top, that's the number one priority, right? So adding that arachidonic acid is probably not bringing your total PUFA up anywhere near where it used to be. And so if you calculate your vitamin E requirement on what your diet used to be, it's going to cover the current needs of the arachidonic acid. All right, Iris had a few other questions related to this. So one is, I wonder if I can absorb these high doses of arachidonic acid all at once or if it's just a waste. Like I said before, if you're not absorbing fat, you're probably going to have, depending on how bad it is, you're going to have greasy stools that are going to float. Uh, you know, Generally speaking, the absorption of fat is very, very high and you should assume it's 100%. You know, if you if you feel the need to manage it, you can spread it out, but I, I don't think you need to. 
She says, I know that high doses of arachidonic acid makes me need more vitamin E, but can high doses of arachidonic acid be harmful in other ways besides from that? And if so, what are the symptoms of an overdose of, on arachidonic acid besides symptoms of vitamin E deficiency? I don't know of any arachidonic acid toxicity syndrome. I think that arachidonic acid would primarily be harmful in excess by raising the degree of oxidative damage that could occur. But we covered that. Uh, although I would add that vitamin E is not the be-all, end-all of protecting poop in the cell membrane. Vitamin E relies on vitamin C to recycle it. Vitamin C relies on glutathione and or NADPH to recycle it. Glutathione depends on NADPH and riboflavin to recycle it. They rely on the pentose phosphate pathway, which uses glucose to recycle it. The pentose phosphate pathway depends on thiamine, calcium, and magnesium. And there are two and there are more than two enzymes in the pathway, but there are two enzymes that are of particular interest. Transketolase is dependent on thiamine as a cofactor, which is vitamin B1, and is subject to uh, various epigenetic harms. For example, alcoholism harm epigenetically harms transketolase as well as harming thiamine status. And then glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency is the most common genetic defect in the world. So you need to think about all of that when you're protecting PUFA, not just vitamin E. Vitamin E is just the cream of the crop. <laughs> it's just vitamin E is the it's not really a figurehead, but it's it's um I guess maybe it's the president, but you can't forget about the cabinet, you know? Um, all right. Iris concludes with this quote from the aqua permaculturist, Dr. Brian von Herzen, who says, quote, we see the potential to save the ocean one kelp forest at a time, and that literally we have collapsed most of the fisheries on the planet. Sadly, half of the fish biomass has been extracted in the last 30 years, and 90% of the big fish are gone from the ocean. And with aqua permaculture, we see the potential to regenerate the primary production from Tasmania to California and across the tropics to create habitat to forage fish, the small vegetarian fish, and ultimately to regenerate the schools of sardines and anchovies, even of wild salmon, in a way that ultimately enables permaculture to transcend traditional aquacultural practices. This is from Marine Permaculture with Dr. Brian von Herzen and Maura Gamble. Iris says, I really want to do what I can to be part of saving the planet. And I did not know that life in the oceans to me seems to be the most endangered life forms here on the planet, that oceans, deserts are spreading this quickly. Well, I'm not familiar with any of those topics, or at least, well, I wouldn't say I'm not familiar with them, but I don't have any expertise in them. I would just say that we should all try to do our part to be good stewards of our ecology, but we also have to focus on being healthy. And so if you need some fish to be healthy, you know, for example, if you don't find the DHA supplement that you would want for plan A during pregnancy, then I think it's important to put your health first and the health of your baby first because whatever problems we have now will be solved by our future generations and we need to make healthy future generations above all. All right. Well, I hope this proves useful for many of you. Thanks, guys. And thank you to Iris for donating this consultation to the public.